You know, when you think about, uh, and I want you to think about today, the fact, the reality that uh, all over the world uh, on this day, a uh, day that's often marked out as a, as a holy day, a day to worship our Lord, all around the world, millions and millions of people are praising our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and to think about that, it's, it's hard to sometimes when we come into this building and we just see the people that are around us, but when you think of the body of Christ as the church, when you think about everybody in the world that believes in him, everyone who praises him, everyone who bows to him, everyone who prays to him, everyone who serves him, Everyone who's dedicated to live their lives in honor and glory to him is, is truly an extraordinary, huge thing that we are a part of and can't, can't even comprehend. And, and yet, all of that began with a father believing in his son. All of that started with a father believing in his son. Last week we talked about uh, the importance of passing on the most important thing to our children. Uh, for us to believe in our children enough to pass on to them the most important thing, and that's the fact that God believes in them. To pass on to them spiritual life. Sure, we want everything we can give them in this world, but the most important thing, even if they had very little of what this world has to offer, spiritual life's the most important because it's not just going to last for this life, but for eternal life. And when we learn that God believes in us to be able to do that, we become uh, kind of in awe. You mean you can use me? to carry that out? And, and the answer is yes. He equips us. He gives us everything we need to pass on to our children. But the reason that he can believe in us is because he chose to believe in his son even before the foundations of the world. Even before he created anything, even knowing that it was all going to go to hell in a handbasket, it was going to fall. Man, creature, the world, everything. He still chose to go ahead out of love because he believed in us. And the reason he could believe in us is because of his son. And so that's where we start today. Uh, as we look, oh, I better get my Bible. Uh, we're going to take a look at... Uh, the Gospel of Mark at the very beginning of that Gospel together. And, um, it, and it's like at verse 9 is where we start today. Uh, in verse 9 it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open. Can you imagine what that must have looked like? The, the heavens torn open. And, uh, and then what he saw was the Spirit descending on him like a dove. In other words, it wasn't really a dove, but the Spirit is what descended on him. But it must have been in a way that a dove might have come down. And then there were these words that came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. You know, when you just read those words like that, I can't imagine uh, them being that plain. <laughs> to, hear, to hear God's voice, to hear, and, and even that the emotion of God in that, Knowing what it meant, not, not just for, for he and his son's relationship, but for he and the relationship of the world. 
It, it's God who was so incredibly proud of his son who was willing to live a human life. Doesn't seem like that's, that's all we've ever known, right? But can you imagine God becoming a man? What, why would he be proud of him? Because he is willing to do everything it's going to take to heal the relationship that has been broken between man and God. That's why he's proud of him. And he's also proud of him because of what he's about to get into. When we read on in this text, immediately after Jesus is, is anointed, you could say, with the Holy Spirit, and by the way, this is an incredible passage just in regard to the Trinity. You have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus, you have the Father all here working in tandem on behalf of us and all people in the world. And, and the first thing that happens is that Spirit pushes, drives, moves Jesus out in the desert not to go on a vacation, but to be tempted to be tempted directly by the enemy the enemy that had been cast down the enemy that was now roaming the earth looking for someone to devour and who better to devour than the very son of God and all of his temptations are about that it's the very thing that caused him to fall the pride to want to be in charge it's the very thing that caused man to fall. The pride of being able to be like God. And he puts that before Jesus and Jesus rejects it. And how? With the same word that he has given us to reject the temptations in our lives. It is written. It is written. It is written. And then there's the next step, which is really kind of, when you, when you think about it, okay, you have God. He's been sent here to do the work of the kingdom of God here on earth. But, but then he calls 12 guys. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going, really, God? Or is it these 12 you want? If, if you've ever seen that, you can Google it. You know, what a misfit bunch of guys that he called. Uh, and, and later on, they were known as uneducated. Uh, and, and he calls these 12. Seemed to be very inadequate, overlooked people. God calls them, which should encourage all of us. That God calls us and he uses us. And he invested in them because he believed in them. He invested in them by living with them for three years and, and had them walk with him. And he invested in them by equipping them, by sending them out two by two. He invested in them by, by believing in them and their ability to do what he would give them to do. Did they ever fail? Absolutely. Did they ever have fears? Quite often. Was he patient? Yes. Did he rebuke them? Yes. <laughs> Do you see the relationship? Is it any different than his investment in us today? No. He still calls people that are inadequate. He doesn't wait, a, wait for us to be adequate to carry on the mission, but he calls us and then equips us. And so today, he invests in us. And by the way, the greatest investment we all know that he made for each and every one of us, and this isn't just a byline, it is the most important investment, and that was the investment of a perfect life that he lived, first of all, but then he gave. He lived it, but then he gave it. And that is the exact payment that we needed to be able to be believed in 
as we put our trust and our belief in him, now God can put his trust and belief in us. I want you to think about today as we look at this next passage, uh, the power of influence. And this is in 1 Corinthians. It says, be imitators of me. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. As I am of Christ. Paul had a great influence on people like Timothy, young Timothy that he wrote to. Uh, we have the power to influence just as Paul did. These words are spoken to us. I, uh, I want you to think today about people that, that have believed in you, in your life, and, and what that has meant how that has encouraged you, how that has helped you to become who you are. I, uh, I sat down one time uh, at the encouragement of a speaker uh, to go through and inventory all the people in my life that I could just think of all the way through that influenced my life, that made a difference, that mentored me in some way. And it was amazing how long that, yeah, it started with mom and dad. I, I was blessed to have parents that believed in me. And the sad thing is not all people have parents that do that. Some can't even list that. But the list goes on to pastors and teachers and Lucy Schmidt that's been here and, and uh, from uh, Winter, South Dakota, my Sunday school teacher. She believed in me, even when I was the honoriest kid in Sunday school. I'll never forget it, when I got to college, I was kind of a fish out of water. Showed up with my uh, cowboy boots and jeans and still smoked like a chimney, which made everybody kind of look at me funny. Um, I had to sign up to, to be a part of uh, a, a retreat, uh, to be part of the DCE program. I'd never been on a retreat my whole life. I didn't know what it was. You go out into the woods and you do what? But So I, I, I didn't sign up. I thought maybe I don't really have to go, and Bill Carpinko the head of the D.C. department saw me one day on campus. He goes, Wade, I noticed you don't have your application in. I said, yeah, okay. He goes, there seems to be something wrong. Is there something wrong? I says, what is a retreat, and what are you going to do? I was not real comfortable. He says, well, just come and see. It'll be all right. And I said, okay, fine. So I signed up. First thing they did was they took my car away and they made me ride in a bus with everybody else. And we did go out in the woods, but we went to this retreat center and the first thing we did in this retreat center is they gave us uh, a name, but I didn't get to see it. They put it on my back. And then we had to walk around and try to guess who we were. I was so biblically illiterate, I had no idea where to even start. And it didn't help when these people were trying to be nice and said, you know, it's really easy. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then finally, I'm the last one, and they're all still milling around waiting for me to ask the right question. And uh, I just finally says, hey, if I didn't hang on a cross, I have no idea. I didn't know that much. I was the Apostle Paul, and I couldn't even ask questions to figure out I was Paul. And then later on, we go into this other room, and we're doing this game where we're going around, and we're supposed to think of our favorite Bible passages. I had John 3.16. I was so miserable by the time we got to the sit-down Bible study that I just wanted to disappear. And I, and I sat down there, and we were studying this part, and then they said, now we want you to go off by yourself 
and, and just meditate and think about this. And I was like, yes, I can be alone. And I went across this field and I got into a ditch and I laid there. And I just thought, what am I doing here? And I, and I was in tears. I was like, what, do, what am I doing at Concordia Seward? How can God use me? And all of a sudden, Bill Carpinko shows up over my shoulder. And I'm like, hi, Bill. <laughs> and he goes, how you doing? Great. And I said, I think you, you promised me I could go home anytime I wanted. And he goes, well, why do you want to go home? I says, I don't belong here. He said, yes, you do. You belong here because you're going to be the DCE that understands what that kid is feeling that doesn't know how to find a Bible passage. You're going to understand. See, he believed in me. He talked me into staying. Now, that is what God did through Bill. That's why I'm here. So you can blame Bill. <laughs> That's a testimony. You have a testimony. You're here in these pews because someone believed in you. You're in the world to be an instrument of God because someone believes in you. I want to turn our attention to the fact that this generation that we're asked to influence and make a difference in, uh, there's all kinds of studies that's been done about this generation. And it's a generation that, uh, first of all, the first temptation that they say you face more than any other generation is the temptation of entitlement. Uh, but I want to say that there's a lot of backwash on this one. And what I mean by backwash, I think we are a society that feels very entitled. Uh, part of the reason that this generation feels that way is because they've had it so good. And that's why we all kind of feel that way. We expect certain things that other, other countries, people in other countries wouldn't even experience. The second temptation is a temptation that, to divine the truth uh, as you see it. And that comes from a culture that has diminished uh, the authority of the word of God. And God was glorified uh, at the museum, creation museum, at the ark, because it's a place that does hold up the Bible as the inspired and errant word of God. The six days of creation, as soon as you pull that out, you pull the rug right out from under the gospel of Jesus. We have a generation that's moving away from the church because we have a church that has moved away from the word of God. If we really want people to be excited about what the church is doing, first of all, we've got to uphold and give them the true word of God. And so today, we understand that temptation because they've been told uh, by a society that says, you know, truth is whatever you make of it. It's what's true to you. And then the third temptation is the temptation to postpone adulthood. <laughs> when, when do our young people become adults now? Or think in contrast to that, when did people become adults back in the day, whatever your day was? I mean, it used to be that you became an adult in, in Jesus' time when you had your bar mitzvah or bum mitzvah about age 12. A little early for us, right? Then we created teenagers. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we did that. And then you became adults when? When you be 
get graduated from high school. Or you became an adult when you what? Joined the military. Or you became an adult when you graduated from college. Or you became an adult when you got married. Man. Do you know what it is now? Do you know when you become an adult now? Any idea? When you have a baby. Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> it's, it's moved. It's been put off more and more. So if there's uh, low expectations, if the generation is expected to grow up and be an adult until you've had children, man, that can leave quite a gap, especially when they're not getting married till after 30 and not having children. And... But do you realize what that does to marriages when you're not even expected to grow up until... You have children? That's a temptation. But the greatest, and this is from the studies of this generation now, this generation's greatest strength, and this is incredible, this generation's greatest strength, you are the most cause-driven, mission-minded generation in modern history. That's what's been observed about this generation. Does that sound like a possible power plant of spreading the gospel? Absolutely. God believes in this generation, and we should too. But what this generation needs is the truth. That's why we need to expose them to the realities of creation, the realities of a fallen world, the realities of a plan of God to save that world, how God worked out that salvation through all of history how he consummated that plan in his son Jesus Christ when he sent him to live and die and rise again and that he still lives and that he's there empowering and ruling and giving us life. There's a truth that we need to impart to this generation and we can only do that as we get serious about mentoring. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about how to mentor someone. And I want you to come to that. One of the things we're doing in our education of youth and uh, children is trying to bring mentorship from our older people into the lives of our children. We're going to be having a mentor program instituted for our new confirmands as they carry forth into another phase of their life. We're serious about connecting people with other voices that are going to encourage and strengthen and be an example, just as Paul was an example. In 1 Timothy 4.12, he encourages Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and in conduct and in love and in faith and purity. If we don't give the truth to this generation, they're going to find their causes. They're the generation that when somebody goes through cancer, a friend, they all shave their heads. That never happened when I was in high school. They're a generation that wants to save uh, animals that are going extinct. They're the generation that will sell out for a lot of different things in the world, but if we don't give them the truth about the reality of a fallen world that they live in and that the main reason, the cause that we have to live is the cause of saving a world from death and condemnation. And so today, in 1 Peter, God believes in us when he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's what we have to give the next generation because it's been given so freely to us. That's how we glorify God in this life. In His name we pray. Amen.